I'm Robert McCall Miller, I'm Professor of Linguistics and Scottish Language at the University of Aberdeen. Robert, could you tell us a bit about your background and your expertise in the Scots language? Right, um, I grew up in a Scots-speaking family in Renfrewshire in the southwest of Scotland and I've always been interested in all the dialects but the dialects of the northeast or indeed of northern Scotland have been my primary responsibility over the last 25 years. Uh, I've also been involved in particular in an analysis of the ways in which the vocabulary of the fishing communities on the east coast has changed over the last 50 to 60 years. Well, we're just having a good old news there about our culture here in the northeast. Um, for, uh, firm in a background next to the North Sea. And um, we're just uh, sort of having a good old news about what has made this area tick in the past and how it's operated. Right. I think one of the interesting things about the North East is that traditional ways of life survived considerably longer than they did elsewhere, at least when you compare it to central Scotland. So that industrialisation never really happened in the North East, not in the way it did see in Glasgow and the area around about it. So from that point of view, the North East continued developing its own way of life that was agriculture and fishing and forestry and a few other occupations as well and this was carried out well into living memory as something that you know people had done the families had done for centuries quite often now a lot of that is gone now because because of new technologies which have come along since the second world war basically uh, and this is probably inevitable. And to be honest with you, sometimes when we talk about how much we enjoy remembering, part of that enjoyment possibly comes from the fact that we don't have to have that sheer toil, the, the misery sometimes of, say, agricultural work before the invention of labour-saving devices. Um, we, we forget about how difficult it was to fish until at least the Second World War for most people. It was dangerous and you might come back after a week with nothing in your nets. This is important to remember, but whether we want to continue it is another matter. But there are elements within that culture which inform many people in the North East today in terms of the, the culture of song and of celebration and of commemoration, which is so part of so many people's lives here of remembering and continuing elements of it. Whether that just be continuing guising as it originally was at Halloween, or whether that be remembering how New Year cultures continue through the year, or in holding uh, Al Il and Al Nerdi celebrations in January. These are all part of our continuing culture here in the Northeast and in the way in which we learn from it and move forward with it. Resilience. Yeah. Resilience. I think that's something that I find has stood me in good stead from my culture and background, yeah. um, is resilience. How can we sort of tap into that resilience that was embedded in us into from our forefathers? I don't think, I mean, tap into it would possibly be a slightly artificial thing if we were just trying to produce it. I think most people are faced with situations which, well, it's not the same as what our ancestors had, that has similarities to it. And it's then that you find people. I've known people here in the North East who have suffered often quite terrible things and show that ability to shoulder the pain and to shoulder the great disappointment they've felt in a way that people from where I come from would probably have sort of done terrible damages to themselves, but they carry on. You don't say very much, you carry on. Okay. Agricultural <laughs> servants. Yes, uh, and even in my time, Robert, now I'm only 60. Mm. I'm only 60, right? But I was, when I was born and brought up in a firm, um, you know, I'm one of five. Yeah. That's how I was like, a farm hand. I didn't see me as a youngster growing up in the country. I saw me as a youngster who had to work on the farm, you know, and that to me is something that will always stay with me. 
um, it's deep rooted and it makes me who I am and I'm quite passionate about that. But it's only now that I'm this age and I've got the extensive um, knowledge and um, you know mm. life experience that I've got that can maybe bring it out. But I think it's fascinating that any culture, you know, we're not just speaking about the Doric culture, any mm. culture can bring out the best in people. Yeah. Robert. Any culture uh, also can bring out the worst in people. <laughs> Uh, but, but that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's the other side, of, the other side of the coin. But yes, I think that's certainly true that there are, if not exactly unique, there are certainly special things about the northeast of Scotland, about its language and its culture, which should be preserved and remembered, and in some ways developed into something which people now can carry on themselves. Because I suppose it was always like that. It was one generation passed on to another one, who developed it, who changed it and went on with it. And I think what we're trying to do with the Doric Future is to bring a new perspective to our culture, mm. you know, um, to bring in from all aspects of life and all different age groups, you know, we're all part of Aberdeenshire, mm. new Aberdeenshire, you know, and it's drastically changed since I was a kid, mm. you know, with oil coming to, sure. to this area, um, of how we have changed for the better or well i mean I, I don't think most change is not necessarily for better or for worse it's better and worse i don't think most people would want to go back to the days which are not that far away in some places in the northeast where there was limited electricity for instance or that you know heating was of a very different order I mean, I think things have changed in the sense that the people that you will meet on a daily basis will be uh, strikingly different in their backgrounds from what they were, uh, you know, maybe 40, 50 years ago. So, that, for instance, in the street I live in, there's a number of people from very different backgrounds. You know, there's a number of people from Scotland, but like me, not from the northeast. There's a number of people from Poland, a couple of English people, one person from Africa. Now, I personally rather like that, but of course it does have knock-on effects. It can add things to the culture, and there's no doubt that at times it does. But it can also obviously change it in such a way that it gets submerged into vernacular English-speaking culture, and you could be basically anywhere. Um, with that. Yeah, and I think that's what we're trying to do. And a lot of people are trying to do this, you know, but it's trying to, you know, to so that we're that we are remembered who for who we have been here in the past mm. and what's made Aberdeenshire the place that it is. You know, despite that fishing and farming are both a bit on the demise. Yeah. I mean the there have been a, a people here who have made their mark and you know, through um the written word, through song, mm. you know, through the spoken word and I mean that's that's what your um have a your thing yeah. has been has been the spoken um primarily yes yes, uh -huh. yes. Well, people's language is important because it's part of the way that we express identity here in the northeast there are ways that people say things uh, like for instance wh being f uh, why uh, why being why uh, why that sort of thing which are very central to the way people do that sort of thing um, also, at times, grammar as well comes into it, although that's maybe less important. But the thing which marks off people here in the northeast or marked them off was knowledge of vocabulary. Vocabulary to do with their lives, but also vocabulary to do with emotional states, to do with um, funny things, sad things, some of which were shared by all Scots speakers, but some of which were certainly confined to the northeast. For instance, um, the word stew for dust, as in you couldn't uh, knock the, uh, the, the dust, uh, you couldn't knock the stew off a bap. Uh, that sort of uh, expression is peculiar to the northeast. Everywhere else in Scotland we say stour. Ficher for to fiddle with things as well. Uh, my daughter came back from school a few years ago and she said, oh, I had s such a ficher. And that pleased me because she hadn't produced much Scots before that. But I knew she hadn't heard that from me because I would naturally say footer. Um, she had got that from somebody at school and that made my day. So vocabulary is central. But the problem is that vocabulary is central to 
pastimes and occupations, some of which are less important, have disappeared entirely or have changed so not uh, noticeably that people just don't use these words anymore. I'll give you one example of this from fishing, which is the word barkin. Barkin was where you um, you covered clothing and also uh, ropes and nets in a particular substance made from tropical bark. Uh, you only did it outside because it was incredibly pungent, the smell, and you painted it on everybody and ev on everything, and everybody took part in that. So you had a, ba a barket jumper, things like barket trousers, and so on. Now, when I've been doing work on this, People over about the age of 60, 65 spoke of it fondly, remembered it extremely well, spoke about the communal fun that was taken in doing a very boring job. But nobody under that had a clue what it was because uh, plastic came in sometime in the 1950s and you didn't need to do barking anymore, so people didn't do it. And the whole concept disappears like that. That's why it's so important to record but also to encourage our children to speak. It's spoken, a spoken word. Yeah, the body is affected by the use of language around them. Uh, this can be a good thing but it can also be a bad thing because certainly particularly in the city of Aberdeen itself I'm aware of the fact that there are many middle class young people who would be difficult to tell where they came from in Scotland. That wasn't the case 20 years ago. That's changed. But the same is true also for working class uh, people. I'm aware, sitting so close to Tilly Drone, that uh, young men from there, they sound northeast, but often the vocabulary they're using is actually West Central. It's the Glasgow area that's being used because so many people moved north during the oil boom uh, and have affected it in various ways. Plus it's seen as being roch. Roch? Yes. Uh, to uh, use uh, that sort of uh, language because it's associated rightly or wrongly with street gangs and things like that. So people do that. Now, I mean, change will happen and that's just life uh, in anything. But there's no doubt about the fact that this gradual homogenization of language is something that I regret very much. It's fascinating listening to you a professor of the Scots language, mm. Mia Ferm Quine. I could listen all. I could listen all day to you, <laughs> Robert. You know, because we don't often have the, you know, the privilege of being able to speak to somebody that's learned mm. on a particular subject. I mean, something as passionate as, as you know, or the way that we speak. Let's continue with gathering people um, for Doric future and and looking at a new perspective of Doric, how we can present it, especially mm. to our youngsters, because and also you know people abroad are coming you know, want to connect back to their roots. So I think there's a big, there's a big, there's a big wave going on at the Absolutely. moment. Absolutely, yeah. And I think we're quite uh, in, excited to be part of it. Uh, I'd like in the first instance to say how pleased I am to be filmed and also because uh, you came in all the way into Old Aberdeen to see us uh, into the great traffic system of Old Aberdeen, uh, which is wonderful. Often when you work at a university, you do sometimes feel like you're doing things in a void. So it's um, very handy to be able to speak uh, outside that because it is very important to recognise that what is passing is passing. And if we do not do anything about that, um, we will find just bare memories which will pass away of themselves. If we can record now people who are in their 70s, and that's very easy to do now, what we can take from that is an archive which can be brought forward uh, perpetually, or at least for a very long time. And this sort of initiative is central to it and should be encouraged.